Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, the book that uh, I said last month that I would read because I hadn't read in a while, so I was forcing myself to read by telling you all and encouraging you all to read it along with me so we could talk about it. So here we go. I'm not going to be able to go very long into this video before doing spoilers, so I'll just kind of give the briefest of synopses and then give you a big old warning that I'm about to get into spoilers and then we'll move from there. And yes, I'm using the green screen because I don't want to clean up my room. So basically the book is following these two uh, kids, these two teenagers during World War II. One is a French girl who's blind, her name is Marie, and then a, a boy named Werner who is German. The story goes back and forth between their lives. There's also a third uh, story of a, a German officer who's looking for this diamond. He's like one of those, uh, you know, n one of the Nazis tasked with uh, acquiring all the, the goodies, the valuables around Europe. So, you know, for the Nazi regime. And so it's interesting because the book gives you two characters on either side of the war. You have Marie, who is um, living in occupied France. She starts off in Paris. She lives with her father, who is the locksmith at the Natural History Museum. When the Germans invade, they flee to uh, her great uncle, so her grandfather's brother's house in St. Malo on the coast. And uh, her father, who's who I said works at the Natural History Museum, is given something to take with him. Uh, you find that out pretty early. It's not much of a spoiler, but there's this diamond called the Sea of Flames at the museum. And when the Germans invade, they make a few copies of it, and then they give the real one and the copies to employees of the museum without telling telling them who has the fake ones and who has the real one and sends them out so that they can, you know, kind of throw the Germans off the scent so they don't get this diamond. The diamond, by the way, is supposed to be cursed. Whoever has it is like a mortal, basically. But then everyone around that person uh, meets misfortune. So Marie's father is given one of these. He doesn't know if he has the real one or a fake one. And they go off to St. Malo. Meanwhile, this German officer is looking for that diamond. And so he's tracking, tracking it down all over the place, hunting down all the fake ones and the real one. So that adds a bit of uh, tension to it. Because you know, I mean, eventually he's going to come across Marie's father. And then on the other end, you have Werner, who is... Uh, Turns out that he's really gifted at fixing radios, and he lives in a coal mining town, he's an orphan, and at the age of 15, the boys are required to go work in the coal mines, uh, but the reason he's an orphan is because his father died in the coal mines, so he's facing the possibility of going right where his father did, and perhaps getting crushed to death like his father. So... Through uh, a lucky break or two, a, a like German official needs his radio fixed. Werner goes over and fixes it. And this German guy is like, dude, you need to go to, uh, you're like a genius. You're like a, a wunderkind. You need to go to Nazi uh, military school for gifted young boys. And he sends him off to that. Or he recommends him to it. So Werner's like, well, I don't really care about the military, but at least it's going to save me from going into the coal mines. Of course, the irony is, in the very first chapter of the book, he's in St. Malo. The, book start, the, the structure of the book is interesting. It starts in St. Malo in 1944. Both Marie and uh, Werner happen to be in the city when the Americans come to bomb it. And Werner, within the first few chapters of the book, the bombing ends up trapping him in uh, a basement of a hotel 
And so, you know, it's ironic. He thought he was escaping being trapped and crushed to death in this subterranean uh, enclosure. And yet that's where he ends up anyway. And so really one of the interesting, one of the things in the novel that keeps you going is trading off between the two stories of Marie and Werner lends a kind of energy where you just want to keep see, seeing how it builds, how it, how it, how, and how they're all going to come together in the end because you figure they've got, there's got to be a connection. And actually, about 100 pages in, if I remember correctly, you start to see a connection, a small connection. It's not that big of a spoiler, so I'll say it. Basically, at the beginning, Werner and his little sister Jutta in the orphanage, they're playing with their radio and they find this channel, or they find this signal from a French guy who's basically like the Bill Nye, the science guy of 1930s uh, France, and he's like teaching science for children. And the kids know French because the orphanage matron or whatever she speaks French she's from France and so in their childhood they've been, they listen to this guy on the radio talking about the universe and stuff and then later on once Marie goes to St. Malo you find out oh crap that was her grandfather and the radio station sending out that signal is her uncle's house where she's staying now where the radio is still set up oh my gosh and you learn this pretty early on and one of the great things about this novel is that it presumes that you are smart enough to put this together, so it doesn't like batter you over the head with it. It kind of just, it leaves it just enough, gives you just enough to know, okay, that's, it's her grandfather who was in those records, the records that were played on the airwaves. So that's about as far as I think I can go without getting into major spoilers. So so for those of you who don't want to see the spoilers, I highly recommend finishing or getting this book. You can get it down in the description below. If you want to skip ahead and see what the next book is that, that I'm going to read and dictatorially claim that, uh, proclaim that we all should read, I'll put the number here and you can skip there now. For the rest of you, hang on through a commercial break and then we'll talk a bit more about the novel. Okay, thanks for sitting through that commercial break. So let me just give some reactions to the book. The writing style of the book grabs you right away because it's in the present tense um, and it's very economical, yet still somehow poetic. Uh, you know, I, I never really felt like uh, Door was was being unnecessary with the words he was using. I never thought he kind of went off into the weeds. He was really just telling just enough of the story to keep it moving. He really likes, he, he's really good at writing dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue in it. And that also gives it a fast pace. I mean, if anything, that's what I would take away from this novel. I mean, it's 500 pages, but it goes so fast. It's so fast paced. Of course, um, thematically, the mo one of the most terrifying things about the book is just the the way it gets across to you that war, basically, every, like everyone was forced into it. You know, no one has a choice. It seemed like that was that seemed to be a recurring thing, especially in Werner's story, is choice and f free will. And you know, you hear that so much of with with the German soldiers that they were just following orders and through Werner's story you can see how he was you know he didn't have a choice it was either go work in the mine and possibly suffer a horrible death or go into the military and at least he I mean he got to do what he wanted to do in the military at least he was doing radio stuff and there's an interesting you know his sister, Yetta is kind of like his conscience in a way. And uh, he constantly thinks about her with the stuff he's doing. And whenever he does something that he feels like slightly ashamed about, he thinks of her. Because she, I think she comes to symbolize, I don't know, the, the German conscious 
conscience, maybe. Um, or at least his conscience. And there's a period of time where he just stops writing her altogether. And I don't remember exactly when that is in the book, but it's kind of when he really fully slips into, you know, buying into, this is what I do now, I'm a soldier. But with both of their stories, you, you see how the war basically, it's going to tear up your life. You have no choice. You can't get away from it. With Marie, you know, being in the the country that was invaded, they didn't have a choice. They just, okay, you're invading. We can't do anything about it. Our lives are put on hold. And meanwhile, on Werner's side, it's like, okay, well, I guess I have to fight in this war. I don't really have a choice. You know, it's out of my hands. That was a a very powerful theme, I thought, an undercurrent of the whole thing is like the collect the collective insanity of war just takes over. There's not nothing that can be done. Overall, I actually think Werner's story was more interesting than Marie's because Marie, in some ways, her character. That's one thing I'll say about. It. I don't think I think the characters were a little flat, especially Marie, because she was basically just doing what she had to do to survive. And she says as much towards the end of the book when she and Werner meet up. Uh, she basically says, I, I think she says, I'm not brave. I just did what I had to do to stay alive. I'm probably butchering that, but I mean, she does brave things, but we, we don't see her struggle necessarily with that. Whereas Werner, on the other hand, he's doing all these things where, you know, he stands by and watches as his friend Frederick is, you know, beat up and he doesn't stand up for his friend because he knows he'll get it too. And then, you know, when they finally go off to war, he being the radio tracker, I'm not sure what you'd call him, but he's the guy who basically finds the people who are using the radios and he's so he's directly responsible for these people getting killed, even though he's not the one pulling the trigger. And it's interesting how he kind of has to distance himself mentally from it. It's like he's just finding the signal and telling them where to go. Um, he doesn't have to kill them. Volkheimer goes in and kills the people, but then he, Werner, has to go in afterwards to get the radio parts. So he has to see the aftermath of what he's been responsible for. Of course, you know, it slowly starts to get out of control. Because at first, you know, it's just, okay, these Russian guys, whatever, they get shot. Not a big deal. They're the enemy. But then, of course, you know, the most shocking thing is when he goes into, when they go into Vienna and he sees the little girl uh, playing in the swing set. And then they go up into the apartment building and, uh, what is it, Neumann accidentally shoots the girl and her mother. And for the rest of the book, that little girl haunts him, haunts Werner. Even though he wasn't the one pulling the trigger, he was responsible for leading them to that apartment because they were trying to track a radio. So I thought he was the most interesting character of the two of them because he was the one who was most in conflict with himself and the most tortured by his actions. You know, Marie never really has to think twice about what she does because she's fighting for the good guys. You know, she just she goes and gets her bread with the secret message inside. Okay, yeah, she's risking her life, but uh, I'm not saying she was a badly written character. I'm just saying she was not as interesting. And in many ways, I think Volkheimer was one of the most interesting characters because here he is, he's presented at first as being like this brute. Um, but then you get that little scene where he's listening to the classical music and he's like, oh, he's human. Then you go out into the field with him on the hunt for these radio guys and he's shooting him in the back of the head and he doesn't, you know, it's just part of the job, whatever. But then later on, you see, a, you see this humanity in him and how he's like he like looks after Werner and cares about him and then you know at the end when he seeks out Yutta to give him Werner's belongings he definitely has one of he's not like a really main character but he has one of the most interesting arcs in the book i think that ending was interesting uh to flash forward to 1974 and to see like the aftermath 
And and that's one of the interesting things is because Yutta is Werner's conscience, you know, earlier in the book. And then in the aftermath of the war, she like feels guilty for being a German. Basically, when she travels to France, she's like, oh, my gosh, these people are going to, you know, you know, they're going to hate me once they hear that I'm German. You know, even though she didn't do anything and she ended up, you know, there's that the shocking scene towards the end where you know, they're trapped in Berlin when the Soviet soldiers come in, which was like, uh, <laughs> that was such a difficult scene to read. Afterwards, I like, had to stop reading the book for a few days. So she suffered, you know, just as much as anyone in an occupied country, yet she's the one later on who feels guilty. And, you know, it weighs on her conscience. At first, the, the addendum, the 1974 and then the 2014 you know, later chapters seem a little like maybe they're extraneous, but they're, I don't think they are thematically. Maybe to the story they are, but thematically, no. Because, you know, that, that beautiful last passage, or it was some, in the last chapter, where it ties in the idea of, you know, it's basically the title of the book, All the Light We Cannot See, and how, you know, radio waves we can't see, and... At the end, Marie is with her grandson who's, you know, playing a, a video game. And so it's like n now there's even more that we can't see, although the Wi-Fi and stuff and how there's messages flying around through the air, text messages and, you know, TV, phone calls. And we can't see it. It's all on the light. And... In that passage, it basically says, aren't, aren't, you know, the souls of these people maybe also light that we can't see? And their stories are just flying through the air. Uh, and that, I thought that was a really beautiful passage. It's very moving. You know, Marie is blind, so she can't see any light. And Werner can see, but the thing that he cares about most is radio, which is something that you can't see. And of course, there's the there's one passage that was on the radio that Marie's grandfather said uh, on that record that Werner heard. I can't remember exactly, but it's something like, open your eyes and see before your eyes close forever. I feel like there's a deeper meaning to that. It's like, yeah, see all that you can with life, but also, you know, see the stories of the people around you. See the, the stories and the souls of the past, if you can almost equating life with light. I also thought it was um, plotted pretty well, and I really enjoyed even kind of the, you know, Von Rumpel, the Nazi officer who's looking for the diamond, even his personal reasons, like he wants to find the Sea of Flames because he like kind of believes the, the stories about the curse, and he's like, if I can just get a hold of this diamond, my cancer will go away, you know? Even that, I felt like it was it was starting maybe to that he the author handled it in a really good way where it didn't feel all of a sudden like genre fiction, you know, like he hinted at it just enough. He never explicitly said he never had Von Rumpel sit down and say, "I gotta get that sea of flames so my cancer will go away." It's kind of just hinted at, which is what I, this book is great at is. The book knows that you're not dumb, and so it doesn't tell you everything. It lets you connect the dots. It gives you just enough to connect all the dots. That's what I love about this book. So overall, I say beautifully written, well-crafted story. Characters were pretty good for the most part, though I'll say if there's any weakness to the book, it's that, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't like cardboard characters. It was just maybe not f completely as fleshed out as they could have been, but no, it wasn't, it wasn't detracting from the book. And I also appreciated how, you know, the horrors of war were written about in a way that it still had the emotional impact and you knew, like, all the horrible things that were happening, but it wasn't, like, graphic or anything, you know? It was, it was well said. It wasn't like Game of Thrones describing someone <laughs> getting brutally killed. This video might be a little shaky, a little boring. Um, I've really had to dive in and 
pull out my 11th grade English uh, skills for it. But I thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you for reading this book along with me. And I'd love to hear what you thought of the book. Let me know in the comments section anything that I touched on or anything that I missed. If anything, just let me know what what story in the book that you thought was most interesting. If it was Werner, if it was Marie, if it was Von Rumpel, if it was some other character therein, Volkheimer, please let me know. All right, so for the next next month, the big reveal in my dictatorial book club. I'm going to read this, and I'd love it if you all read it too, so that when I discuss it in a month, there will be an audience for it. But it's going to be A Gentleman in Moscow, Moscow, Moscova, Amor Towles. That's not how you pronounce it, I'm sure. But Washington Post says, transfixing, full of colorful characters, colorful characters. I don't know anything about this book. Uh, I don't know if it's considered literature or genre fiction or what. I don't know if it's good, bad, if it's going to make me look like an idiot. But I thought, why don't we just, let's just try it out because people say it's good. I've read part of the first chapter already and it takes this big shift because this is like a traditional written in past tense book. So it's weird to shift from present tense, all the light we cannot see, to past tense. It's bizarre. If you would like to buy this book new and you want to help support the channel, uh, do me a favor, buy it through my affiliate Amazon, my Amazon affiliate link in the description below and I'll get a small amount of the proceeds from this book and I'd appreciate it very much. But I won't hold it against you if you want to buy it used or go to the local library. Thanks again for watching. Yeah, let me know what you think. Leave a like if you liked it and uh, until next time, keep reading.